Today we're comparing the AMD Ryzen 7 9800X 3D to Intel's Core Ultra 9 285K. And you might be thinking this is a pointless comparison, you know, considering the 285K loses to its predecessor. But let's not forget Intel literally marketed this as made to game and ready for anything. It's not like their previous generation 14th gen chips are like their separate gaming processors that you should buy only for gaming. This is their latest and greatest CPU, which is why it makes sense to compare it to the 9800X 3D. But also I just wanted to see just how much the 9800X 3D beats out the 285K and also whether or not Intel has has a chance at a comeback here. Quickly glossing over the specs, the 9800X 3D comes with 8 Zen 5 cores and 16 threads, a 5.2 GHz boost, 8 MB L2 cache, 96 megabytes of L3 cache and a $479 price tag. The 285K on the other hand has 24 cores in an 8 plus 16 core configuration, a 5.7 gigahertz boost, 40 megabytes of L2 cache, 36 megabytes of L3 cache and a much more expensive $630 price tag. Now the key changes that have been made to the 9800X 3D are obviously it's Zen 5 cores and also 4 nanometer process but more importantly it's underside 3D V cache architecture. Unlike in previous generations where they had the 3D vCache stacked on top of the main CCD, this time around they've implemented the 3D vCache directly underneath the 8 core CCD, which as you would expect would improve temperatures and thus overall voltages, clock speeds and overall performance in other applications as well as gaming. Now the 285K is a more radical architecture shift with two new core architectures, Lion Cove on the P cores and Skymont on the E cores, but also the changes include but also the changes includes the removal of hyperthreading as I mentioned and the new 3 nanometer TSMC process on the compute tile which is where these cores are situated. Now as for our test bench specs for today on the 9800X 3D we're using ROG's Crosshair X870E Hero, G-Skills DDR5 6000 Mega Transfers Seal 28 RAM and on the 285K we're using the Z890P Wi-Fi from ASUS and also G-School DDR5 6400 Mega Transfers seal 32 RAM. Now yes, we're using faster memory on Intel, but I'll explain why. Due to Intel's radical shift in architecture, they've also updated the memory controller on these new CPUs, which means Intel requires faster RAM to maximize the speed of the CPU. That's why on these new CPUs, Intel recommends for their memory specifications 6400 mega transfers RAM, so that's why we're using it today. We're also using a 980 Pro 1TB, the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2420, and what's that? An RTX 4070? No way this guy is using a 4070 to test CPUs. Okay, jokes aside, but the real reason is because it's the only GPU that I really have available at the moment to test these CPUs, mostly because of budget reasons and because I'm a small channel. But to counter that, we're first going to go through some CPU bound games at 1080 and 720 in four games, and then another four more GPU bound games in bar charts against other CPUs. Then of course we'll go through benchmarks, frequency, temperature and power analysis. We've also set both of these CPUs to the high performance power plan which is called Ryzen High Performance on AMD and also Intel APO or Application Performance Optimizer is enabled, not that it will provide a substantial improvement. We also set the 285K to the Intel defaults on the performance setting and not the extreme given that that's the default setting. Starting us off in Red Dead Redemption 2 at mostly medium settings with no anti-aliasing, at 1080p the 9800X 3D led by 10% on average. However, I did seem to note that the 9800X 3D had pretty lackluster 0.1% and lows, but overall it didn't seem to hamper the experience that much. In addition to that, I noted that the 285K had 11% higher 1% lows, although I did note that the 285K had much lower GPU utilization, which could hint at greater CPU limitation. At 720p, the 9800X 3D led by 19% on average. Once again, I saw pretty low 0.1% lows on the 9800X 3D and 31% higher 1% lows on the 285K, and this could be due to micro stutters as the 9800X 3D's frame graph seemed to be a lot less smooth than the 285K's. However, once again, this didn't really impact the experience that much. Far Cry 6 on the high preset with no anti 
pricing showed that the 9800X 3D led by 16% on average. And this time around, I didn't seem to notice any micro slitters on the 9800X 3D, with 1% lows being 19% higher on the 9800X 3D compared to the 285K this time. However, utilization of the 285K didn't seem to exceed 26%, which could hint at optimization backed up by lower GPU utilization. Or it could be a CPU limitation overall, it's pretty hard to say. Now 720p showed that the 9800X 3D led by 49% on average. GPU utilization, or lack thereof, became more prominent on the 285K, barely ever exceeding 60%. And clock speeds seemed to fluctuate on the 285K often versus the 9800X 3D, which impacted its lows. The 1% lows overall had a 46% lead on the 9800X 3D, with clocks locked at 5.2 GHz. Now in CS2 with all low settings with no anti-aliasing or any upscaling of any kind, saw the 9800X 3D lead by 7% on average. This is all the while 1% lows on the 9800X 3D led by 37% despite the mere uplift in averages. The 285K on the other hand, well that would reveal micro stutters when encountering smoke grenades or NPCs in CS2, impacting its 0.1% lows especially. And it also seemed to emphasize lower than expected CPU and GPU utilization. But it's pretty hard to tell if this is optimization, given that games don't use all CPU cores, even in CPU limited scenarios. 720p shows the 9800X 3D leading by 28% on average, with the 0.1% lows on the 285K suffering due to the micro stutters once again, with the 9800X 3D leading by 58% and 1% lows. And GPU utilization barely ever exceeded 60% on the 285K. Now in Age of Mythology at mostly high settings with no anti-aliasing or upscaling, the 9800X 3D led by 53% on average at 1080p, and this is an extremely CPU limited scenario for both given the extensive physics, particle effects, and characters present. As such, lows tanked on the 285K, with the 9800X 3D leading by 42% and 1% lows. But utilization on the 285K never seemed to exceed 18%, which I thought was interesting. At 720p, the 9800X 3D led by 52% on average, but we only saw a mere increase of FPS on both the 9800X 3D and 285K, which does suggest that the game is limiting the CPU utilization. However, 1% lows on the 9800X 3D jumps to a 59% increase. Now jumping into some more graph-based comparisons with more GPU limited games, in Cyberpunk at 1080p with the higher preset, we saw a 5% increase on the 9800X 3D as we become more GPU bound with lows within the margin of error. Now in Forza Horizon 5 at the high preset, we saw averages within the margin of error, but the 9800X 3D in 1% lows led by 3%, but again we're heavily GPU limited here. In Rainbow Six Siege at the high preset, with no anti-aliasing, for the very first time we saw the 285K lead over the 9800X 3D by 2%. But given that the 9800X 3D loses to its predecessor, calls this into question. The 285K also led 1% lows by 10%. Now Shadow of the Tomb Raider at the high preset, again with no anti-aliasing, we saw a 19% on the 9800X 3D and a 30% lead in 1% lows. Our overall average at 1080p shows the 9800X 3D leading by 4% in more GPU limited scenarios. Now in 720p, Cyberpunk shows the 9800X 3D leading by 4% and loses to the 285K in 1% lows by 11%, but again we're still slightly GPU bound here. Forza Horizon 5 shows the 9800X 3D leading by 3% with 6% higher 1% lows. Now in Rainbow Six Siege, the 9800X 3D led by 17%, however it only leads by 2% and 1% lows. And finally, Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows the 9800X 3D leading by 51% on average, with 8% higher 1% lows. And our overall average at 720p shows a 9800X 3D leading by 19% at 720p. Taking a look at our summary for both 1080 and 720p, starting us off in performance per dollar or value, the 9800X 3D had more value by 46%, but this is a surprise to literally no one, given it's much less expensive. Performance per watt or efficiency shows the 9800X 3D leading by 33%. 
and overall power consumption, she was a 285K consuming 19% more. But the 9800X 3D wasn't far off. Now on our Adobe Suite benchmarks, the 9800X 3D surprisingly led in Photoshop by 24%, but obviously loses to the 285K in both Premiere Pro and After Effects by 20 and 5% respectively. But this is to be expected given the 285K has many more cores that both Premiere and After Effects can leverage. Also taking advantage of Intel's quick sync encoders, especially in Premiere Pro. I did think that Photoshop was surprising on the 9800X 3D though. In the Blender benchmark, the 285K leads by 72%, but once again, this is a surprise to literally no one because of much higher core count. In Cinebench Multicore, it also leads by 78% over the 9800X 3D. But the 285K also led in single core by 14%, suggesting that single threading performance is quite good on the 285K. And the limiting performance we saw with the lower than expected CPU and GPU utilization could very well be due to optimization. But the benefits Intel has in single threading is most likely to be outweighed by AMD's advantage with increased cache thanks to 3DV cache anyway. Even if Intel strains out the supposed optimization issues, AMD overall might still have the lead in gaming. In the 7-zip compression benchmark, the 9800X 3D surprisingly comes quite close to the 285K, with the 285K still leading by 37% in decompression and 30% in compression, which was surprising. Now looking at the clock speeds in Cinebench, during the Cinebench 10 minute throttle test, the 9800X 3D stayed stable at around 5 GHz on average, very rarely dropping at all, at most to around 4.8 GHz. The 285K on the other hand, well that was wildly inconsistent, only maintaining an average of 5.05 GHz while reaching as low as 2.4 GHz. Equals on the other hand averaged 4.2 GHz, dropping only as low as 3.2 GHz. So while they weren't stable either, they were certainly more stable than the P-Cores. But it's pretty disappointing how even the E-Cores were inconsistent. Looking at power, again in Cinebench, the 9800X 3D averaged 154 watts, reaching only as high as 159 watts. And the 285K on the other hand averaged 2 223 watts, but reached as high as 244 watts which is again to be expected. What was not expected though was the 9800X 3D averaging 86 degrees and getting as high as 89 degrees. But compared to the 285K, it's much more respectable. With that averaging 90 degrees, reaching as high as 97. On the 9800X 3D, I did think temperatures were a little higher than expected, especially considering I'm using a 420 millimeter radiator here. But considering the clocks seem to maintain themselves, I can't really hold anything against it. Looking at clock speeds during a gaming scenario in Cyberpunk 2077 at the high preset 1080p, we saw clock speeds on the 9800X 3D averaging around 5.2 GHz and stayed around that margin gracefully. The P calls on the 285K on the other hand were much more stable this time around compared to Cinebench, averaging closer to that 5.4 GHz mark but fell as low as 5 GHz. E calls on the other hand maintained 4.6 GHz pretty much all the time. So so overall, the 9800X 3D held up a strong lead over the 285K, especially in CPU limited scenarios. But GPU limited scenarios, like in Cyberpunk, highlight how the 285K wasn't far behind, and as well in games like Forza Horizon 5. But again, these are pretty GPU limited scenarios. Games like Red Dead Redemption 2 also demonstrated better frame pacing on the 285K versus the 9800X 3D with higher 1% lows despite losing in averages. But again, this proved to be an outlier. However, dropping down to 720p revealed that the 285K really started to struggle, being absolutely demolished by the 9800X 3D with micro stutters and limiting 1% lows, but overall lower than expected CPU and GPU utilization. The 285K of course dominates in productivity, there's no surprise there but the 9800X 3D showed a surprising lead in Photoshop. The possibility of it being an optimization issue on the 285K is slightly reinforced by the inconsistencies in clock speeds, which we observed in Cyberpunk, although the indication is more likely to come from the lower utilization overall. The single threading result we observed in Cinebench illustrates strong per core performance, but this never translated to gaming performance. And as mentioned, if Intel does ever resolve some of these supposed issues, X3D still might very well have the lead in gaming due to the inherent cache advantage. But don't count out Intel just yet. Intel very might well have an opportunity to improve with microcode 
software, scheduling, etc. given the lower than expected utilization. But what do you think? Do you think Intel has a chance in gaming? Or do you think AMD is going to continue to demolish Intel in gaming? Tell me in the comments down below. Anyways guys, that's all for today. Make sure to like, subscribe and hit that notification bell. Also make sure to click this video right on the screen right now.